Hi, I'm Dr. Christopher Newman. I'm Professor of Space Law and Policy at the University of Northumbria in Newcastle in the United Kingdom. I'm also International Space Law Advisor for the Cold Star Technologies. I listen to the Cold Star Project. The show is for entertainment purposes only and is not intended to be what is termed professional advice. The Cold Star Project is proudly presented by the Operational Excellence Society. Cold Star Tech is a supporter of the OPEX Society, and Jason Gannigan is a member of its board of advisors. Talk with us at Cold Star Tech to find out more about the OPEX Society and what we can achieve together in your organization, or just visit opexsociety.org. Thanks for joining us for today's show. Today, I'm really excited to bring you Peter Thorpe. He is the owner of Peter Thorpe Design since 1975, almost as long as I've been alive. The guy's got a lot of experience. And he was also creative director of the Space Frontier Foundation from uh, 1988 to 2008. So he has great uh, experience in the space industry. And I really enjoyed meeting with him. I don't often get the chance to meet up in person, but uh, Peter happens to live in the Asheville area, which I also live in. So this is a really fun episode. We have a lot of images to share. If you're listening to this, uh, I always link down in the description if there's some sort of photographic evidence or something that I want you to look at. And in this case, I think we'll have a whole Google Drive of images that Peter has created linked to, as well as uh, online shop and things like that. You can pick up prints or originals. So, this is really fun. Peter, welcome. So one of the reasons I wanted to have you on after discovering you and watching you for a couple months and not hassling you <laughs> is that... Uh, Art can be a tough subject as a young person to believe that you can make money at, right? And uh, so I'm curious about how this journey happened and, and what happened to help you believe that you could make money being an illustrator and designer. Well, I started drawing when I was very young. And so everybody around me said, oh, he's going to be an artist. I said, well, all right, I'm going to be an artist. Except I wanted to be a scientist. Yeah. I, actually, I wanted to be a zoologist. I love animals. And, um, but drawing came easy. Mm. And I just kept drawing and painting as a child. And um, somewhere around in 1974, my father and I went to England for a trip. And I very much loved the Tolkien books okay. and the C.S. Lewis books. And the illustrator of the C.S. Lewis books, Pauline Baines, mm. was very nice. I sent her a letter before I went there and I said, I love your stuff and I'd love to meet you. I ended up being here the next summer because I went to an exchange program there in Oxford. I went and, uh, and met her and her husband at her house in um, Surrey. And I showed her my little drawings and she said, yes, you can be an illustrator. You can do it. You can do just what I do, but you have to work hard and it's really, really hard. But she said it and that was it. And um, she became quite a, a wonderful mentor to me over the years. Uh, she died in 2008, and I do her treatment website now, but Pauline was great, wonderful, and uh, she knew Tolkien personally. Okay. She, one of her very first things that she did was Smith and Wooden Major. Uh, this was in the 40s, after The Hobbit, but before Lord of the Rings came out, and um, she had brought a portfolio of her work into George Allen and Unwin, and left it there, and Tolkien was there, working on um, Smith and Wood Major, going over it with an editor, and he happened to see her work, and he said, well, how about this? Who's this person, Pauline Vance? Said, well, she's a new illustrator. Well, let's let her do it. And he loved this, what he saw, and she did medieval sort of, you know, yeah. art at that time. And um, he loved what she did with that, so she ended up doing a lot of, to uh, a lot of his stuff, and it was, uh, he was the one who suggested her to C.S. Lewis for the Narnia books. So, you know, this is just great stuff that I was able to go and visit this illustrator. And, um, and this is all before cops. This is while I was in high school. So then, uh, I was I'm in New Orleans, this is where I'm from. I went to a college in the Bay Area, California College of Arts and Crafts in Oakland. And um, I just loved uh, fine art. And so I went to a fine art school, but I always wanted to be an illustrator, so it was a bit of a black sheep. And my father, being a CPA, loved the idea of me wanting to be an illustrator, you know, to, to that, where I could make money. And um, so he urged me to, to pursue that as opposed to the fine art. Um, and I was just lucky enough to get work. While I was in school, uh, I 
did, I was doing magazine covers, I was doing book work for publishers in the Bay Area in San Francisco. And um, by the time I graduated, I had a full portfolio of published work. And I was going to stay in San Francisco, but a buddy of mine who had graduated a year ahead of mine went to Los Angeles. And he had spent a year there trying to do publishing, and he wasn't getting too much work. And so he called up one day and he said, listen, I'm moving to New York City. If you'd like to go to, both of us going would be a lot better than just one. You could help each other out, rent a place together. Well, the day before, my girlfriend dumped me. Hmm. And so I don't know this part. <laughs> and so and so I said, sure. He goes, no, I'm serious. I said, sure, let's do it. And I told him that I had mm. broken up. And uh, he goes, I tell you what, I'll call you tomorrow morning. If you still say yes, we'll do it. So he called up the next day, and I said, yeah, I want to do this. So mm. on a whim, off to New York City, and I'd never been there before. And he's like, oh my God. And but we had good portfolios. He had a year's worth of work from LA stuff, and I had all my stuff. And within just a few months, we were getting work. Mm. And um, one of my um, strengths, uh, I, I consider it to be simple, but I'm good with type. I've always felt mm. at ease working with type. And so I went to publishers, and I said, look, I can work with type, and I can do illustrations. And usually, at, at that time, they would job out the illustration to one person and the type to somebody mm. else. And to have somebody that could do them both was a plus. Yeah. So I started getting work right away at the publishers. And before I knew it, I was just doing tons of book work. Mm. I've done hundreds of book covers over the years. And I've been lucky to work on bestsellers and stuff of that nature. So, uh, yeah, but I wanted to be an illustrator for me. Even though I like to find art, I, I, early on I wanted to do what Pauline Baines did and my, my heroes. So from the, the data points that I've seen from your bio, you, you yeah. moved around a bit, right? Yeah, you yeah. New Orleans, LA, California, New York, and then now you're in Asheville. Yeah. Um, was that necessary, do you think, for your career, and especially in today's age where everything's remote, I, most of the work that I do is remote? I, uh, I left New York City to, to live in with a girlfriend in Connecticut, mm. and that lasted three years. And then after, after that broke up, I thought, well, I'm an only child, and my folks were in North Carolina. They were in Pinehurst, actually. Okay. But oh. um, they were getting old, and they needed help. And I said, well, instead of going back to New York City, I'll go down there. At that point, I had so many clients I could work remotely. It was, you know, every, and I was on the computer at that point. We were talking 1998. Yeah, a lot of the options you guys have today just were not available. <laughs> 1980 or so. Right, right. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, when I moved to New York City, it was 1980, and I was doing paste ups, you know, mechanicals by hand, cutting and pasting. And by the time I left, I, everything was on the computer. So then I made that transition. And then in Connecticut, I was doing stuff. Um, remotely anyway. So so when I uh, made the decision to come down to North Carolina to be near my folks, it was pretty easy. I, I didn't have to be in New York. But I must say, New York was wonderful. I kind of wish in a way that I'd stayed there longer, not done Connecticut, but that's the way it goes. Yeah. Um, Do you miss the winters? <laughs> well, in New York City, I lived in Manhattan. Okay. And it didn't really matter that much. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I, I was on Park Avenue South, and there was a a subway station a block away from me, you know, or a cab, you know, you go right in the subway, into a cab, get off, get into another building. I mean, you know, you don't spend that much time outside. Yeah. Huh. Connecticut was, was quite a, an eye-opener for me, especially since I hadn't ever even seen snow until I moved to New York City. Huh. But, um, yeah, growing up in New Orleans, you don't see snow. Right. Yeah, and there was none of the Bay Area. Anyway, um, so I spent some time in Pinehurst, mm -hmm. first couple of well, a year and a half, and but it was just in the no, it's a golf world and I don't play golf, mm -hmm. and uh, I had friends here in Nashville, mm -hmm. so I finally decided I was just to you know, see the folks by driving the four hours back and forth mm -hmm. every few weeks, which I did a lot of. I've driven back and forth across the state about 150 times. Mm -hmm. They passed away uh, quite a few years ago, but while they were alive, I was going back and forth quite a bit. And um, yeah, so that's why I came here, basically, yeah. because the folks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I know all about driving back and forth across the state, <laughs> east to west. <laughs> North to south is not so bad. <laughs> <laughs>
So let's talk about your connection to the space industry then. You, you mentioned to me that you attended the first adult space camp in 1985. Right. Let's right. talk about what that experience was like. I know it was a long time ago, but what do you remember about it? And, uh, well, how it affected you? I had always been interested in space from when I was young. And my first introduction was uh, Robert Heinlein, mm -hmm. Mr. Niles. I loved that stuff. And I loved his philosophy and everything. Mm -hmm. And even through college, I was reading the stuff and everything. So um, I kept up my interest in space. And when I read some, I don't even know where, that um, they were going to have an adult space camp, I thought this will be fun. Mm. And so I went and did it, and it was great. I mean, we were just a bunch of nerdy, you know, Star Trek kind of loving people, you know. But some of these guys were pretty serious, and I kind of fell in the crowd of a bunch of guys that were fairly serious but fairly fun loving. We'd go to the bars afterwards, and it would just be a blast. And it lasted only like four days. But um, it was just a great experience to do it, and we had our jumpsuits, and it was my play, you know. And um, so I come back, and that was November of 85, and uh, in January of 86, the Challenger blew up. Right. And I, um, I, um, I sat, and I was watching it live, you know, mm -hmm. and they only ran it on C-SPAN, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and I knew exactly what happened right away, and I was like, oh no. This is going to kill the space program. And I said, no, I, I had to do something. And uh, so I called up uh, National Space Society in Washington, D.C. I found out about them. I said, look, I'm in New York City. What can I do? And they said, well, there's an organization there called L5 New York City. And it's run by a guy, uh, Rick Tomlinson. And they meet on the aircraft carrier Intrepid. Well, that alone was great. I'm going to go to, right. to a meeting on an aircraft carrier? Hell yeah. And um, <laughs> so, you know, you, you, you enter on the hangar deck and then you go up to a ready room and he's like in the head of, Rick is there in the head of the ready room and we're, we're talking and all, and we just hit it off really well. And uh, I brought my portfolio, my book cover portfolio with me, which shows no space stuff whatsoever. Uh, and I said, I don't know how this translates, but if I can help, yeah. I can do this. Maybe I can do s similar things for you. And he's like, yes, you know, mm -hmm. let's do it. And he and I became great buds. And then a couple years, I did stuff for L5 for some other small things that he was working on. And in 1988, he and a few other people formed the Space Frontier Foundation. And their basic push was for free enterprise space as opposed to government space. They didn't want to destroy NASA, but they wanted to put NASA in its place. They felt that NASA wasted tons of money, took forever to get stuff done, give it to free enterprise. And um, I became their creative director and, and did that and for 20 years until 2008. This when is we, the Space Frontier Foundation, Space Frontier which Foundation. still exists. Yes, yes. But it's now to the next generation, the younger generation is doing it. We decided in, in 2008 to hand it over and give it to the younger generation. Nice. Um, but during those 20 years, I went to tons of conferences in D.C. and L.A., various places, and also in New York, and met a lot of very interesting people, including Elon Musk, lots of interesting astronauts like Al Bean and Buzz Aldrin and interesting authors, Ben Bova, Spider Robinson, all these interesting people, and um, picked up on their enthusiasm. And I just wanted to do, to help the space movement. Yeah. And I, you know, I guess I could have hooked up with some other organization, but I ended up with the Space Frontier Foundation. And uh, it, was, it was great fun. I mean, I, I've got some stuff here to show you. This is the sort of stuff that I would do. These um, uh, news magazine weapons. covers, yeah. Yeah, I, so I did, I did all that, and I designed the entire thing. I do their conference reports, uh, programs, on and on. And um, so I was the graphic guy. <laughs> so I was the graphic guy, and um, in a way, I sort of felt like an outsider, sort of, because they're all technically minded. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out a geosynchronous orbit. I'm not actually know what it is, but I, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm not the super technical, but I can take what they give me if they explain to me and, and show it in a good graphic you know, way right. and make it accessible. And, um, but I just found out that these people liked, they liked having somebody like me around, somebody who wasn't Mr. Techman, you know, right. and had a different perspective on things. And um, 
So that was great. That was very uh, fulfilling. So when I do an illustration, I, I use a palette, a wet palette like this. Hmm. And it, it'll last for days. I cover it over at night. And uh, it'll last maybe a good week. But eventually, but eventually uh, I'm done with the illustration. And I've got all this extra paint. And I've got to get on to the next uh, illustration, so I just would throw it away. Hmm. And at some point, it occurred to me, like, you know, I'm throwing all this paint away. What I shouldn't be doing that. What should I do? But I didn't have time to, to paint something else with it unless I painted an abstract. Hmm. And I had lots of board laying around the studio and canvas. And so I started taking this extra paint and just doing sloppy background abstracts, just big brush strokes. Okay. And, um, so Rick was by, he lived in, in New York City at that time, Rick Thomas, and he came by one day and he saw these, and he's like, wow, these are great, what are you going to do with these? And I'm like, I don't know, I just didn't want to waste paint. He goes, they ought to do some space, you know, maybe like outer space stuff. I thought, maybe rockets, you know, mm -hmm. do rockets. And so I started doing these rockets on top of these sloppy backgrounds, and people started going nuts for them. And so I started giving them to people in, in the foundation, and... Uh, then they said, well, look at, at the next conference, come and sell some. You know, mm -hmm. like, nobody's going to buy them, you know? Oh, they all went, you know? And so then I just started off with the rockets. So now I've got this whole side business of doing these rocket paintings. And a lot of big people have liked them right. Right, over the years. And um, so um, I got invited to be uh, part of Nova Space. They're out of uh, Tucson, they're a gallery. Uh, they handle space art and space memorabilia, flown stuff. They have astronauts come to their conferences and all. And so I got in, I became one of their artists, and uh, through that I became a member of the International Association of Astronautical Artists, IAAA. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm I, you know, I, I, by weaving my way through uh, being a creative director at the, at the foundation, I'm now part of that. Um, and these are people that do technical, like you know, NASA quality renderings. Okay. And I'm here doing my sloppy art with <laughs> rockets, but they, everybody loves them. And, they, and I've told those guys, I, I feel like a Van Gogh amongst a bunch of Da Vinci's. Hmm. And they said, yeah, well, we all like Van Gogh, all right? So, <laughs> Do you have those available as prints, or are they yes, yes. Okay, I, not I, just one off? So. Yeah, I do. I have all. Some of them is. Uh, I'll link to that below. Yeah, let's get that. So, um, so it's been fun, but you know, again, I'm not one of these technical guys. I still, I go to the conferences, and sometimes I go and sit in some of the um, talks. And I have no idea what they're talking mm -hmm. about, you know. But the overallness of it wanting to be in space, of wanting humanity to move out into space. That, I think, is super smart. Um, Rick um, Tomlinson, early on when I was working with the Foundation, introduced me to Gerard K. O'Neill, who wrote The High Frontier, who um, invented the mass driver, and who pretty much came up with the concept of space colonies, the O'Neill Cylinder, his name for him. And so I met him, and I started doing work for them, and the whole, you know, basic concept of we must be a multi-planet species if we intend to survive came out of listening to him and his people talk, and it just makes total sense to me. And so, I have a lot of friends that are artists that could care less about space, couldn't care less about space, excuse me, I always get that wrong. Anyway. Um, and I'm, I've become pretty good at trying to tell them why they should mm -hmm. like it. I mean, do you like Beethoven? Do you like, uh, you know, Shakespeare? When you want that stuff to go on into the future. You don't want it to be just on one planet. Believe me, ask a dinosaur. Oh, wait, they're all dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Huh. Guess what happened to the dinosaurs? So um, it's become a, a, an interesting, fun thing for me to do, to figure out uh, how to argue to my non-space okay. friends why space matters. Uh, then there's also just the inspirational aspect of, of uh, doing these paintings, the rockets, and somehow, and I'm still not sure exactly how, teachers in England, it must have been some, somebody high up in the Teacher Association in England, saw the rocket paintings, which I have online, and decided that this would be a great thing for kids to, to look at and, and to do their own space art. And um, I started getting emails from teachers in England saying, uh, 
we're, we're, our assignment this year is, is for our kids to do Peter Thorpe space rockets, you know, I'm like, oh my God. And could you judge our, our entrance, you know, and all this sort of stuff? And, and then I've, I've, gotten <laughs> letters, sure. I've gotten letters from the kids, you know, I've, I've given all the feedback I can. And so I am inspiring kids. Mm -hmm. And I basically tell them, look, you guys are young enough, I'm really jealous, you're young enough that you, some of you people will be going into space, you know, to maybe work, maybe just to visit as a tourist, but you can do it, you know, mm -hmm. and um, it's just great, it's great to, to be able to inspire, you know, mm -hmm. so, but uh, the rocket's basically, a rocket is an icon, and it's an inspirational mm -hmm. icon, so that's about inspiration. Um, so, yeah, I just think that space is extremely important, and it's the most important measure of our time mm -hmm. is to um, become a multi-planet species. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got a quote here from you: "How an artist endeavors to inspire people to embrace space." I'm reading that to make sure I don't screw it up, and I think you're uh, you are living that, which is great. Well, let's, let's finish up with this then, uh, a technical sort of question. You, you mentioned visual research as a, as a part of your cover art design, yeah. and I'm curious about, we talked a little bit about the color palette and that. Yeah. How does that process go for you? Well, back in the day, um, I would have to go to a library or mm -hmm. a bookstore and get books and check out books. And uh, in New York, they had a wonderful thing, the New York Public Library Picture Collection. Mm -hmm. And the picture collection was in the building across from the main branch with the lions out front and all. Thus you go into this building on Fifth Avenue, you'd go up, I think it was the fourth floor, and you'd say, I want uh, a two-headed llama. And they'd have they'd have artwork and photographs, if there were photographs, of two-headed llamas, and, and you'd use that as reference. But you want visual reference. You want to see which, if, if you get an assignment to do a book cover that's in Peru, and it has something to do with llamas, you've got to have a llama on the cover, and it's got to be correct. So the research is very important. That's why I'm a busy street here. <laughs> so doing the research uh, was quite important uh, when I was working with, for the publishers. And, um, you know, the, well, you, you saw my um, blog entry. It was actually Ron, uh, Ron Miller's uh, blog where right. I talked about doing the Tony Hillman covers. That's Navajo oriented stuff. And so I went to the picture collection and I looked up Navajo stuff and I started, started seeing all these sand paintings and thinking, wow, this stuff is cool. How can I use this? And I eventually was able to incorporate those elements into covers. And, um, and I, I was very uh, careful because basically those are religious symbols for them. You know? So you want to be correct. If you did, say, Jesus on the cross and he was bald, you go, well, wait a second, he's not supposed to be bald. So when you're dealing with a, a culture's religious um, icons, you've got to be very careful. So I was very careful about the way I used the sand painting elements, because those are sacred images of the Navajos. And uh, that required a lot of research. Um, but I enjoyed the research, really. Uh, I learned that. It, and it's, it's fun, because you go into an art director's office, and you have no idea what he's going to hand you. And he hands you something about maybe World War II. Now I have some knowledge of World War II, but this would be a certain battle. And suddenly I'd go and I'd read, 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 read on this one subject, and I'd learn, you know? Um, I did uh, a, a Lendate cover that dealt with, it's called City of Gold, and it dealt with Rommel's campaign in Northern Africa. I learned all about that just through the research. It was great, you know? So that's fun, in my opinion. Some people might not think of it as fun, I do. I, I love history, I love researching things. Yeah, and when you've got a nitpicky audience like space, if you don't get the details of the lunar lander right, right they right. will nitpick. I've watched them do it with another artist. Yeah, yes. <laughs> they were kind to that artist. But I, I, <laughs> I just yeah. heard that in a, a fellow space artist, Mark Maxwell, was telling me this that when Norman Rockwell did his um, art of mm. Aldrin coming down the limb, mm. a very famous painting, he, uh, Rockwell did not feel comfortable with doing hardware. And he got in touch with NASA, uh, no, National Geographic, and one of their main artists ended up helping Rockwell with it. I, don't, I forget the fellow's name, but uh, Rockwell reached out and he got help on that, so he was smart enough to do that. So yeah, like something I'll look up later. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, uh, actually I may have 
my, my friend sent me a link to something about this artist, this National Geographic artist who just passed away. Um, but um, yeah, um, that's right. The space stuff, you want to be correct. Except, I, again, with my more inspirational rocket paintings, you know, you don't really see too many rockets like like what I do. I'm doing retro rockets with fins. Here's a there's Bradbury a, type rocket. Yeah, I guess. but there's a great Arthur C. Clarke quote somewhere in the I don't know maybe seventies. He said that he realized that today's rockets didn't need fins. He goes, but I still like a bit of fin. <laughs> So I hope you enjoyed this interview with Peter Thorpe. Uh, I certainly did. It's part of my mission to bring other voices other than technical engineering business type things to you. And uh, I'm always looking for ways to increase our total perspective on the industry. Thanks for listening.